hello and thanks for joining us here on Encore. Coming up on today's show. I'm happy to be talking to a true white American. God bless white America. Sneaking into the most notorious white supremacist movement in American history as a black man. Spike Lee's award-winning cop comedy Black Klansman hits screens here in France. A turbulent time which yielded luminous results. We take a look at Van Gogh's period in the southern city of Arles. Don't you know I'm in a band, huh? And the Australian brand bringing confident pop to Paris. Confidence man gear up for the Rock on Send Festival. We're starting with a film which deals with race relations in the United States. Black Klansman sees a black police officer infiltrate the Ku Klux Klan with surprisingly comical results. But Spike Lee's latest release is not entirely a product of his imagination. It's based on the true story of an African-American brave enough to wade into the white supremacist organisation in the 1970s. The film won the Grand Prix at the Cannes Film Festival. Robert Sutton Mattox takes a look. Ron Stallworth, Colorado Springs' US police officer. There's never been a black cop in this city. We think you might be the man to open things up around here. And he's an audacious recruit. What can I do you for? Well, since you asked, I hate blacks. I hate Jews, Mexicans, and Irish. A fresh approach Italians. and an unlikely candidate for a mission to infiltrate the Ku Klux Klan. The film's inspired by a true story and the real Ron Stallworth. He showed us the membership card, the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> he had it. It was like... This happened, like, I, I, the fact, I, I mean, that's what made it so crazy in knowing that this happened. This is us, this is, this is human behavior right here watching. This isn't fiction. The wars are coming. It's set to the backdrop of racial tensions in 1970s America, the black experience and the rage of white supremacists. The original Ron Stallworth didn't expect the comparisons with contemporary America. All I did was plan on writing a book. I didn't plan on making a big political statement about race, racial relations, uh, Trump's America or anything like that. During filming last year, reality collided with the drama. In Charlottesville, an anti-racism activist, Heather Hale, was killed. An apparent white supremacist is accused of using a car to ram and kill her. I called Susan Bro. Susan is the mother of Heather, so I, wa I wanted her permission. I'm asking a dude, to, can I include the footage that shows your daughter being murdered? And uh, she gave me her blessing and said, use it. The film has already picked up the Grand Prix at Cannes. Success for Spike Lee once again, tackling racism on the big screen. To another new release now, which is also making waves across the Atlantic. Crazy Rich Asians took more than $25 million at the US box office over its first weekend and is fast becoming a word of mouth hit. Featuring the first all Asian cast since 1993's Joy Luck Club, some see it as a milestone, saying it could help redress the balance when it comes to underrepresented minorities in cinema. Yet for its critics, the glossy romantic comedy focuses on an exclusively light-skinned and privileged sector of Asian society and perpetuates racist stereotypes. Its director, John M. Chu, has defended his casting choices, saying the goal of the movie was not to solve these sorts of problems. Here's a preview of the film. I met a girl, I fell in love, and I want to marry her. You're Nicholas Young, you're untouchable. But Rachel's not. Have you prepped Rachel to face the wolves? You know I'm back, like I never left. I really admire you. It takes guts coming all the way over here, facing Nick's family. Another day, another breath. I know this much. You will never be enough. Yo, it's about time someone stood up to Auntie Eleanor. Well, you, not me. Oh, God. She can't know I was ever here. Next to an artist whose canvases still radiate the sunlight of the south of France, Vincent van Gogh spent two years living in the region, and although it was arguably his most artistically productive period, it was also one of the most painful times of his personal life. Erin Agunke takes a look at the post-impressionist painter's life in Arles. In the heart of the southern French city of Arles, 
Vincent van Gogh's legacy has been immortalized. This cafe was rebuilt based on the canvas Cafe Terrace at night, painted by Van Gogh in this very spot. The Dutch painter chose the Provence region for its light and color. He arrived by train to Arles in February 1888. When he arrived, the tracks were still covered with some 30 centimeters of snow. His train was stuck because of the weather, so he decided to get out in Arles. He knew very little about Arles beforehand, so it was total happenstance. He first stayed in a boarding house before moving to this yellow home, which later became the subject of one of his most famous works. Bombed in 1944, it no longer exists today. He rented this small part of the house, and for him it was an ideal location, because just 200 meters from his door, he was in the middle of the wheat fields. So this is where he discovered the Arles countryside that he was so fascinated by. Van Gogh wandered the region by foot for hours at a time, seduced by the diverse landscapes. In the summer, he was particularly inspired by scenes of harvest. Van Gogh liked to go into the fields, paint in the fields, to be close to simple people who work the land. And he paid special attention to nature, the sky, the land that nourishes us, and the people who work on that land. In August, Paul Gauguin's arrival to Arles would heavily impact the painter. The artists lived and worked together for two months until their relationship took a turn for the worst. On December 23, 1888, he fought with Gauguin. And after that fight, he went and cut off his earlobe. He was found in his room, covered in blood. So, of course, he had to be hospitalized. Van Gogh spent four months at a hospital here. He immortalized the institution's gardens in another one of his well-known paintings. The painter's canvas was used to reconstruct the gardens, which thousands of tourists now visit every year in homage to the tortured artist. Despite his deteriorating mental health, Van Gogh painted dazzling scenery in Arles and its surrounding villages, a region forever marked by his artistry. Back here in Paris, live music's on the menu this week as the annual Rock en Seine Festival kicks off in the Saint-Cloud Park in the west of the city. This year's headliners are Justice, 30 Seconds to Mars, Charlotte Gainsbourg and Liam Gallagher, but the three-day event has plenty more in the way of contemporary sounds. Australian electro-pop quartet Confidence Man are bringing what they call confident music for confident people to the French capital. That also happens to be the name of their debut album. Their brand of catchy, good-time pop won over our music critic, Richelle Harrison-Pless, who caught up with band members Janet Planet and Sugar Bones. My boyfriend wants to talk. My boyfriend talks too much. Hi, we're Confidence Man. You're watching France 24. He's just a... Of what I had before, he's just a... With its killer bass line and infectious half-spoken, half-sung lyrics, Boyfriend was a breakout hit for the Australian indie dance crew Confidence Man. A debut single showcasing the group's sonic style. Wacky, outrageous, joyful, punky pop. That tongue-in-cheek, no-holds-barred fun features heavily on the band's debut album, Confident Music for Confident People. It's also the main ingredient in their energetic live shows, which are racking up rave reviews. Sexy and silly, mm. and yeah, just a good time. We've always yeah. managed to break break the crowd yeah, and we break them. Break them, yeah, no, it, and it's it's amazing when that happens. You know, I feel like the vibe like always changes, and it's always like these really excited people who are like just thrusting as hard as we are. Inspired by 90s house, funky breakbeat, and disco bass lines, the four piece from Brisbane cultivate an air of mystery. I wanted it to be a bit of a like surreal project. It's more of like a you know faceless thing. So mm. yeah, we want to keep it a bit um, separate from our true selves. The characters that we, that we would play on, like you know, when we play live, I, I, I just think like those characters are a little bit more exaggerated. And I think those exaggerated people are a little bit more exciting, and they have like a little bit more to give.
champions of dorky or if you speak Australian daggy dance moves, confidence man say it's choreography anyone can follow. Everyone thinks it's intentionally bad, but it's actually just that we're not very good. Just close your eyes and pretend <laughs> you're the only one there. And then hmm. just, um, yeah, don't think about it too much. Don't worry about embarrassing yourself. It's advice I took on board as I left any hang-ups at the door. And then threw them all the way around. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like a hula hoop. Yeah, like a hula hoop. Yeah. Okay. I could do this forever. <laughs> She's a natural. And for those music fans not headed to Rock on Seine, there's a compelling alternative in the form of the Paris Summer Jam Festival, featuring Kendrick Lamar, NERD and Marseille rap outfit I Am. The event's looking to attract similar crowds, 40,000 people to performances in the La Défense neighbourhood. Both of the festivals are organised by major American promoters, Live Nation and AEG, and music critics see the weekend as a battle for supremacy between the two parties. We'll leave you with a taste of what's coming up at the Paris Summer Jam Festival. Do remember to check out our website for more arts and culture. We're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Right stroke, put little baby in a spiral. Soprano C, we like to keep it on the high note. It's levels to it, you and I know. Bitch, be on my